The day Queen Jezebel died was a unique day in Jezreel, an ancient city that was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, witnessing events like never before. That day would mark the execution of Jezebel, an infamous figure in Ahab's household. Jezebel, a notorious delinquent, was responsible for introducing the cult of Baal, the god worshipped throughout Canaan and Phoenicia in ancient times. During the period of the judges, Baal worship infiltrated Jewish life and became prevalent in Israel during Ahab's reign, affecting Judah as well. Different regions worshipped Baal in different ways, creating specific sects that highlighted particular attributes of this god. Baal was seen as a universal god, responsible for agriculture, creation, and human fertility. In the Old Testament, the most significant use of the title Baal is its reference to the main god of the Canaanite pantheon, equivalent to Hadad, the Amorite god with almost identical functions and nature. Jezebel also ordered the execution of the Lord's prophets and incited her husband and then her sons to commit acts of wickedness, being a real curse on the nation. Her reign, marked by three generations, brought ruin and suffering. However, her day has finally come. In the book of Revelation, a false prophetess in Thyatira is compared to Jezebel, being mentioned by name in Revelation 2.20. I hold it against you that you tolerate Jezebel, a woman who calls herself a prophetess. She induces my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Jezebel was exceptionally cruel leading God's followers astray into idolatry through her actions and nefarious influence. Her death marked the end of a dark period and brought relief to those who sought peace and prosperity in the kingdom. A terrible end has come for her, just as is recorded about Jezebel, so that her destruction can be seen as an example of the ruin that befalls idolaters and persecutors. In Revelation 17, 5, 6, it is written, on her forehead was written a name, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, false religions, heresies, and the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the people of God, and with the blood of Jesus' witnesses who were martyred. When I saw her, I marveled with great admiration. A general named Jehu was on his way to confront her. Jehu was no ordinary person, he represented the judgment that God had decreed on Jezebel's family. All this happened because of one specific event, the murder of Naboth. Jezebel had orchestrated Naboth's murder in order to steal his property, and the prophet Elijah had put a curse on her and her family. Naboth was a Geshrelite who owned a vineyard in Geshrel, close to King Ahab's palace. Because of its proximity, Ahab thought it would be a good idea to turn Naboth's vineyard into a vegetable garden. The king offered to compensate Naboth for the vineyard or provide him with an even better property elsewhere. However, Naboth refused to sell the land he had inherited from his ancestors, declaring that it was not for sale at any price. Unable to acquire the vineyard, Ahab became extremely angry and returned home gloomy and angry, refusing to eat. Queen Jezebel, on discovering the reason for her husband's discontent, assured him that he, as king, could get what he wanted. She took it upon herself to resolve the situation, saying, Get up, eat, and cheer up. I will get you the vineyard of Naboth the Israelite. 1 Kings 21.7 Jezebel then began the necessary preparations to get rid of Naboth. First, she forged letters in the king's name, instructing the nobles and elders of the city to proclaim a day of fasting and put Naboth in a prominent place among the people. Two men of bad character were positioned near Naboth with the mission of falsely accusing him of having cursed both God and the king. Naboth was then taken outside the city and stoned to death. Jezebel's downfall, therefore, was not only the result of her own evil deeds, but also a fulfillment of prophecy and an example of the fate that awaits those who practice idolatry and persecution against the righteous.
These accusations were completely fabricated. The diabolical plot hatched against Naboth succeeded because a death sentence could not be carried out on the basis of just one witness. Jezebel took all the necessary precautions to plant two false witnesses, ensuring that the law was upheld only when it suited her. She manipulated the legislation in order to facilitate her lies, thefts, and murders. A particularly odious part of Jezebel's plan was to proclaim a day of fasting, using a religious ceremony to cover up her murderous intent and ensure that Naboth's reputation was tarnished to the extreme. When the queen learned of Naboth's death, she informed Ahab that he could now take over Naboth's vineyard, which Ahab gladly did. Because of Ahab and Jezebel's shocking murder of Naboth, God condemned them both. The prophet Elijah went to the monarch to deliver a divine message. Elijah first met Ahab while the king was inspecting the vineyard he had stolen. The prophet declared, Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? This is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs will lick his blood. Yes, yours. Elijah then prophesied that the Lord would bring disaster upon Ahab's house and that all the male members of his family would be devoured by wild beasts instead of receiving an honorable burial. Ahab was killed in a battle against the Syrians. Elisha, Elijah's successor and a prophet in his own right, continued Elijah's mission. Elisha installed Jehu as king of Israel. Jehu had already got rid of Jezebel's son, Joram. Jehu drew his bow with all his might and shot Joram between the shoulders. The arrow went through Joram's heart and he sank into his chariot. Here we see Jezebel defying the judgment that was to come. She heard that Jehu had executed her son and thrown his dead body into Naboth's portion, according to the word of the Lord, and that he was now coming to Jeshreel, where she could only hope to be the next to fall as a sacrifice to Jehu's furious sword. Jezebel, on hearing this, decided to face her fate. She positioned herself in a window at the entrance to the gate to confront Jehu and challenge him. She didn't choose to hide like someone terrified of divine vengeance. Instead, she exposed herself and despised retreating, mocking fear. See how a heart hardened against God tries to stand up to him, but never has someone with such a hardened heart prospered against him. Thus, Jezebel met her fate in a tragic and inevitable way, showing that resistance against divine judgment is futile. Her ending serves as a grim reminder that those who defy divine laws and commit atrocities inevitably face the consequences of their actions. Instead of showing humility and mourning the loss of her son, Jezebel painted her face, trying to appear grand and majestic in the hope of intimidating Jehu making him lose his resolve and ending his political career. The Lord God commanded his people to shave their heads and put on sackcloth as a sign of mourning and humiliation. However, Jezebel defied these divine orders by adorning herself in the opposite way. As it says in Isaiah 22:12, 13. In that day, the Lord God of hosts called them to weep, to mourn, to shave their heads and to put on sackcloth in humiliation. But instead, there is rejoicing and jubilation, slaughter of oxen and slaughter of sheep, eating meat and drinking wine, saying, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. One of the surest signs of ruin is an unrepentant heart in times of adversity. Those who trust in outward appearances should examine themselves carefully. Jezebel did not tremble before Jehu, the instrument of divine vengeance. On the contrary, she confronted him with a challenging question. Did Zimri have peace after killing his master? Despite God's hand being against her family, Jezebel showed contempt by confronting Jehu, who was only the sword in God's hand. Often when we are in trouble, we tend to explode in passion against the instruments of our problems when we should be submissive to God and angry only with ourselves. Jezebel believed that Jehu's actions would result in his own ruin 
and that he would not find peace. She tried to discourage him by citing the example of Zimri, who attained the throne through blood and treachery, but within seven days was forced to burn down the palace over his own head. Jezebel essentially said to Jehu, Can you expect to do better? However, this was not a similar case. Jehu was not driven by selfish desires and cruelty like Zimri. He was anointed by a prophet and acted on divine orders. When comparing people and situations, we must be careful to distinguish between the precious and the vile. Reformers and those who take bold action may face difficulties, but they should not fear, as it is written in Philippians 1.28. Do not be frightened or intimidated in any way by your opponents. For such steadfastness and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, a proof and a seal to them of your impending destruction, but a clear sign to you of deliverance and salvation, and that too from God. Jezebel tried to discourage Jehu by using the wrong precedent. Zimri's actions were selfish and treacherous, while Jehu acted by divine mandate. It was a mistake to compare Jehu with Zimri, because the circumstances and motivations were completely different. God's judgments on those who have gone before us should serve as warnings, but Jezebel's mistaken comparison showed her failure to recognize the true nature of Jehu's mission. Jehu asked for help against the woman who remained unyielding in the face of his threats and cried out, Who is with me? In 2 Kings 9.32, we read, then Jehu lifted his face toward the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And two or three officers looked at him. Jehu had been called to carry out God's work, to reform the land and punish those who had corrupted it. He now sought assistance in this task, hoping to find others willing to help and support him. He raised his banner and made a proclamation similar to Moses. Who is on the Lord's side? And as the psalmist said, Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of wickedness? Psalm 94, 16. Note that once the work of reform had begun, it was time to ask who would support it. The assistance of her allies resulted in Jezebel being handed over to Jehu, allowing him to carry out his just revenge. Two or three chamberlains looked at Jehu with such a countenance as to encourage him to believe that they were on his side. He then called them not to arrest or secure Jezebel until further notice, but to immediately throw her down, a method equivalent to stoning criminals by throwing them from a steep place. Thus, Jezebel suffered the same repercussions as the stoning she had inflicted on Naboth. They threw her down as recorded in 2 Kings 9.33, he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood splashed on the wall and on the horses, and he trampled her underfoot. God's instruction vindicated Jehu, and consequently, Jehu's instruction vindicated those who helped him. It is possible that these men had a hidden dislike for Jezebel's wickedness and hated her, even though they served her. It's also possible that she was cruel and harmful to those around her, and they were glad of the opportunity to take revenge on her. Finally, they could have done so because they saw Jehu's success and wanted to insinuate themselves with him in order to maintain their positions in his court. Jezebel was thrown against the wall and the sidewalk, and then the horses, all covered in her blood, trampled her while she was still alive. This was the most shameful way in which she could have been put to death, demonstrating the destruction of her pride and cruelty. Thus it is declared that the Lord is just. The dogs themselves completed her shame and ruin, according to the prophecy. After Jehu had refreshed himself in the palace, he thought that the best way to show Jezebel some respect would be to bury her. Although she was a terrible person, she was the daughter of a king, the wife of a monarch, and the mother of a king. In 2 Kings 9.34 we read, When he came in, he ate and drank and said, Take care now of this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. However, although Jehu had forgotten what the prophet had said, 
God had not. According to 2 Kings 9.10 And the dogs will eat Jezebel's body in the territory of Jezreel, and there will be no one to bury her. So the prophecy was fulfilled, and Jezebel met her end, not with honors, but with the shame and ruin she deserved. So he opened the door and fled. While Jehu was eating and drinking, the dogs devoured Jezebel's dead body, leaving only her bare skull, feet and hands, with her painted face gone. According to 2 Kings 9.35, they went to bury her, but found nothing of her except her skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands. The ravenous dogs showed no respect for the dignity of her lineage. For them, a king's daughter was on the same level as anyone else. As much as we pamper our bodies and use them with pleasure, know that they will soon become a feast for the worms under the earth. When Jehu was informed of this, he remembered the frightening words spoken earlier in 1 Kings 21-23. The Lord also spoke concerning Jezebel, saying, The dogs will eat Jezebel's body in the district of Jezreel. Nothing remained of her but the monuments of her infamy. Jezebel, accustomed to making public appearances in a state of glory and glamour, would never again be remembered for her beauty and magnificence. We often witness the wicked being buried, as in Ecclesiastes 8.10. I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out of the holy place, but did not escape their fate, and are praised in spite of their evil, and then forgotten in the city where they did such things. That too is futility. However, sometimes, as in the case of Jezebel, the wicked have no grave. In Ecclesiastes 6, 3, we read, If a man begets a hundred children and lives many years, however many they may be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, and he is not respected, and does not receive a proper burial, he is not laid to rest in the tomb of his fathers. There was no trace of Jezebel around, except in the sacred texts. No one dared to say, this is Jezebel's tomb, so the name of the wicked will rot and be forgotten, even above ground. The story of Jezebel from her introduction of idolatrous practices to her tragic end is a powerful reminder of the consequences of rebellion against God and wickedness. She symbolizes the danger of straying from God's ways and the severe consequences for those who lead others into sin. Her story is not only a historical account, but also an allegory of divine judgment against idolatry, injustice and immorality. The judgment on Jezebel reflects the biblical theme that God does not leave sin unpunished. Jezebel's death, prophesied by Elijah as an act of divine justice, was fulfilled in dramatic fashion, serving as a solemn reminder of God's sovereignty and the fate of those who oppose him. Furthermore, the story of Jezebel is a warning against the abuse of power. She used her position to persecute God's prophets and promote the worship of false gods, culminating in the death of Naboth and the usurpation of his vineyard. Her ability to manipulate and control to achieve her goals reveals the destructive nature of power when used for unjust ends. On the other hand, the story encourages resilience in faith even in the face of great opposition. Many of God's prophets faced persecution under the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, but remained faithful. This resilience and unwavering faith are qualities that every believer is called to emulate, trusting that God is just and will reward righteousness.